Um, we are both audio taping and videotaping today's performance, so it will be part of the archives of the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council History Collective on their YouTube channel called History Collective. Today's performance is part of our Pride Month program here at the Silver Lake Library. Please take a brochure about the rest of the um, In particular, we're going to be wrapping up the end of the month with an after hours comedy night, after hours on Thursday, June 25th. It's co-hosted by the Friends of Silver Lake Library, which if you haven't had a chance to peruse what they have in their bookstore today, you can come back anytime when it's open or to one of their big book sales, or you can join the Friends of Silver Lake Library and get pre-sale information. Um, and then on the evening of the comedy show, which is free to come to, we highly recommend that you visit Silver Lake Wine, who is also co-sponsoring the event. Uh, their wine tasting start at 5 p.m. and it's $15 for a flight, which is three glasses of wine, so that you'll be really, really ready for the comedy that starts at 8 o'clock on library property, which is a city property where you can't have alcohol. So I really recommend it. So, okay, so that's my plug for that. I think I did everything. So enjoy the show. Does anyone have any questions, housekeeping questions, before we get started with the show? Okay. Well, I would like to welcome to our stage, such as it is, the performers and queer guys. distracting myself on a floor of throbbing bass and flashing lights. Jumping high, I fly. My outstretched hands break a laser beam of demonic red light. The audience stepped into a giant, pulsating cunt. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Sherry. <laughs> Exuberance, naked, pulsating rapture. Sticky swagger. I'm Rob. Salacious titillation. <laughs> Voluptuous combustion. Explosive jerky. Queer wise virgin until today. <laughs> Hi, and thanks for joining us. I'm Robin. When I went looking for the dice, I knew where to find them. Oh, <laughs> that's the way. Uh huh, uh huh. I'm Tim. <laughs> Hit from the brown bottle. That, I like it. Uh, 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 Minnesota, huh? How long have you been here? Two months, huh? I've been here for 23 years. First time, huh? Me too. What do you want to do? Dance. <laughs> Dance, huh? Do the hustle. Five kamikazes, a hit from the brown bottle. Carrying the lines in this world. Hot and ready to fill it up. Enticing vitality. Indecisible, Twill the drinks. Throw the glasses on the floor, and I am free. 
I don't know what happened, but I am free. Lied on the floor under the glitter and froth of welcome decadence. Boom. 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 Everything stops. Boom. Boom. I'm out of body, looking down on a cemetery of lost souls. Their features age rapidly. Winged fan dancers stand like stillborn guardian angels, bookending the center stage disc jockey. Like Icarus, I have flown too high. A tumbling snowflake now, down, down, down I go, melting in the rising heat from this meaty mass of sweating bodies. Like a record player after the power is back on, the revelers slowly gather speed, rising again like Lazarus. When I hit the floor, I'm still scratching. Well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm Jen, and I'm not like these poor people up here beside me. I'm what's known as a Lily, a late in life lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Lily! made Joyce a decided edge. We went out on platonic dates 60 years ago, if you're counting. Movies, meals, matinees, hello and goodbye included a kiss on the cheek. Once at a Christmas party while slow dancing, she kept grinding her you-know-what into my you-know-what. <laughs> Fuck, you don't even get a hard on. Joyce, I'm a dancing teacher, you know, like a doctor. <laughs> Years later, over cheap Chinese chow mein, I told her I had a boyfriend. Oh, some doctor. Well, do you want to bring him for dinner? <laughs> Why do they have to dress like that? I mean, the men are practically naked. And I've seen some women, big women too, with their shirts off. And those queens. I mean, why do they have to ruin their own parade? I can't bring my kids to that. I am standing there at work amongst my supposedly erudite colleagues, quiet, wanting to come to the rescue, defend my people. I am quiet, silenced by years of habit, compartmentalizing my life divided. I may not be the spokesperson, and coming out isn't all that. But hey, here I am today sharing one of myself, my most authentic self, with all of you. Thanks for coming. I'm Bonnie Lee. So I don't have a long history of growing up gay, of going through the confusion about sexual identity. Do I like boy, do I like girl? <coughs> the terror of keeping a dangerous secret, of being bullied, of being outed, the drama of coming out and being painfully rejected by family and friends, of stumbling, sometimes racing through life with bars and clubs and bathhouses and hookups and breakups and disease and death. And through it all, looking for acceptance, yearning to be heard, taking a stand, marching together, celebrating every hard and victory, great and small, in the lifelong quest to be considered a valid member of the human race. To be able to say loudly and proudly and freely, I see, I feel, I am, I matter. In the deep, dark dankness of my closet, I felt ashamed all the time. Beginning when I was 12, that would be 1941, I spent endless hours in subway toilets. Tea room sex, we called it. The Brits termed it cottage sex. At 16, an entrapping clothes person, clothes man, groped me, then arrested me. In grade school, I was ashamed to stand up and called upon by a teacher because I was tenting. 
having an erection. I was, when older, I was bolder, discovering the joys of anonymous sex at Our Lady of the I Lost the Page. Sorry about this. Hold on. <laughs> Can somebody else Our Lady of the Okay, I'm sorry. Going back to Lady of the Vapors, uh, one of the many bathhouses in New York City frequented by homosexual men. The Everard in Chelsea was one of the oldest, op operated by the police department, and the NYT wasn't raiding the place. Converted from a church building in 1886, it was affectionately called the Everhard. Until 1988, the Mayor Koch had it closed. There were others, too. The Penn Post near Pennsylvania Station was where I met Jack Hutto, my first real boyfriend. After we broke up, I met Jim Sub there, and we became sex buddies. On the Lower East Side, the St. Mark's Bath, John McDonald and I began a relationship. In 1974, in Los Angeles, Tony Monteleone and I met at the Melrose Bath, and we remained closely intimate for more than 12 years. Oh, how I hated gym class in junior and senior high. Small for my age, a total featherweight, my boy-like physique did not suit the rigors of the hyper-competitive and masculine sports. Always last to be picked for a team, unrecognized for my elementary school athletic prowess, gymnastics, soccer, and badminton. Now I was always chosen last, always last. Yet I endured. I wanted a manly physique. So I embraced push-ups and sit-ups and jumping jacks and handstands to reassure myself that I was not a complete phys ed failure. But being picked last weighed heavily on me. It was as if a laser beam was focused on my athletic insecurities and my emerging confusion about sexuality. Gym class, <coughs> naked men, and last to be picked, ugh. 1990, I transported all of my material belongings and my gentle southern self from North Carolina to Los Angeles, looking to find me. 25 years old and trapped in layers of confusion. Could Los Angeles be the place where I could shed the skin and be me? My first year living in LA, I drove from Melrose and Genesee Avenue to Century City and often detoured on Santa Monica Boulevard. <laughs> I kept my eyes on the road, though, never looked directly at the places in the heart of West Hollywood, afraid someone in the car beside me may notice me. My, per my peripheral vision did catch the tantalizing names of establishments like a different light bookstore, Revolver, Trunks, Unicorn Alley, and Motherload. <laughs> Over time, I secretly dated any number of attractive men although I was embarrassed to be seen publicly with them. George Stein was one of them. On a warm September afternoon in 1952, I was feeling ill, and George came to visit. We were chatting, I in a bathrobe, on the open sofa bed. George, fully dressed, when the downstairs bell rang. Oh, fuck, George, get out of here. What? It's my parents, George, coming up in the elevator. Go down the stairway. Don't let them see you. Why? We aren't doing anything. Just go, George. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> His initial cigarette lighter lay on the coffee table next to the Asheville tray. I hastily grabbed them, dumped them into the laundry hamper, rushed to the door, and welcomed my parents. My mother, seeing my sweaty face, insisted I had a fever and asked for a thermometer to take my temperature. A few months later, I took George to a Christmas party, hosted by two gay men, where I heard another guest say, That nice-looking fella is Joe's new lover. <laughs> <laughs> Women, like Lady Chatterley, had lovers. Not men, not me. Too scary for me. I knew I'd never want to be seen with George again. After a hard day's work, I headed east on Santa Monica Boulevard, and the red light stopped me at Robertson. 
I knew in the next block my peripheral had seen for months a plastic canvas banner advertising happy hour off the side of a bar named Rage. <laughs> I had heard jokes about this drinking hole around the water cooler. I played a game with myself. If I find a parking spot in this block, I'll stop. If not, then home I go. My palms start sweating. My heart mimics a jackhammer breaking up cement on a road less traveled. Well, today it looks like I'm going to get my happy on. <laughs> it's my time to rage. I pull my car into the open spot. Okay, self, check it out. You don't have to walk in. Just, you know, just saunter by on the side sidewalk and casually look in. Well, the double doors were wide open and my feet did not understand just passed by. They carried my wife and the loafer self directly into the first available bar stool. Oh God, now self, you're here. You, you can't turn around and leave. Uh, you know, just have one happy hour drink and try to enjoy yourself. Close your eyes, yeah, breathe, come on, inhale, exhale. Oh. When I open my eyes, this strapping California surfer blonde across the bar sends me a drink. Oh, uh, be a southern gentleman. Show appreciation, self. Just mouth, thank you. <laughs> Forty years later, fit from working with a personal trainer, I relocate to LA, the land of beautiful six-pack men. Oh God, here we go again. I couldn't afford a personal trainer, so I explored alternatives, including the newest fitness craze, CrossFit. <laughs> My box, as the gym is called in CrossFit parlance, was owned by a former U.S. Marine officer. Resolute to give this a try, confident that an openly gay man could overcome such petty obstacles, I enlisted for six months. Soon I realized there was quite a gay and gay-friendly contingency amongst my box comrades. The skills and workouts were tough, and I usually finished last, or near last. I rationalized that I was twice the age of most of my fellow athletes, so no one even cared. Then one day, the coach announced that our box, in CrossFit tradition, would be hosting a competition, a throwdown. My stomach sank, my palms and pit scoop grew clammy, and I wanted to exit the box and not come back. My CrossFit track record did not cry out for me to be on any team. That skinny, awkward adolescent boy again took possession of my soul. What team would want me? Would I place last? This was a dilemma. Should I join in the com competition fun with all my new friends or opt for a ringside seat? September 1963. My heart beating jungle rhythms, I came out to my parents. It went well. My feet wet, I dove in all the way, gradually coming out to the world. The greatest whew, I ever knew. I came out in the early 2000s, assisted and guided by queer friends and colleagues, and especially by the LGBT Center. It was actually easy. No family drama. My parents had passed on. My only sibling, my sister said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my adult son said, that explains a lot. <laughs> and most everybody else in the straight world has figured it out from what I say, what I write, and the company I keep. I didn't have to go through the trauma of the fuck like a bunny stage, a bit too old for it. Best of all, I found a love I never dreamed possible, and I belong to a nurturing, loving community. This community of men and women like me. They really, really, really like me. Gosh, I like me now. Oh my, the muscular bronze surf washer is walking over to me. What do I do? Uh, uh, bat your eyes, son. Just bat them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, he really likes me. He just asked me, do you want a golden shower? <laughs> uh, the audience stepped into a giant pulsating cunt. Pink gauze curtains descended from the massive skylight on the top floor of the woman's building in downtown LA. 
A week earlier, we dyed the curtains from a giant roll of gauze, like the material that covers Kotex pads. <laughs> Though I used the fabric countless for, for countless performance art pieces, the roll was eternally full. It unspooled endlessly, as if the goddess Arachne herself were spinning her mythological thread. In the backyard of a Los Feliz home, we soaked lengths in baths of pink dye, then draped the delicate gauze over hedges. Slender cypress trees pierced the cloudless, rose-colored sky. We stripped naked, slipped into the warmth of a wooden hot tub as we surveyed our handiwork. 1970s hippie lesbians invoking an ancient sisterhood in a Tuscan landscape. It was the opening night of an oral history of lesbianism, a play collectively created by 13 women over the past six months. The pink, cunt-shaped space glowed from within. White folding chairs awaited, one marked with a big red Q for a woman we refer to as the Queen. A month earlier, the Queen had publicly threatened to boycott the show if I was in it. I identified as a political lesbian because I had committed my life to women, but I had a boyfriend. I jokingly referred to myself as a fucking lesbian. The Queen was not amused. Three weeks before the show opened, I told my best friend Sue I was attracted to her. She flatly refused my proposal, quipping, get rid of the boy. A week later, Peter said, I think we should break up. I was baffled. Why? Because it's obvious that you were a lesbian. And that was the end of it, and the beginning of something new, a relationship with Sue that is now in its 36th year. The audience pierced the gauze veil to enter our space. Throbbing lights and disco music evoked a lesbian bar. White folding chairs filled, performers waiting backstage in black. Sue and I squeezed each other's hands and exchanged a look. We were nervous. Sister Sledge was our cue. We are family! One at a time, we danced into the space, ready to tell our stories. I want my sisters with me. Woven together into a show we lovingly called Oral. So, who has been caught in the old town toilet with their pants down, or in the bushes in the park next to the ruins of Anne Boleyn's manor house where Henry VIII went a courting? Such shameful disregard for history. <laughs> Still, Henry, a renowned lech, probably would have approved. Queen Victoria, however, would not have approved of her Victorian facilities being used for cottaging. After humiliating sentencing for their crimes against morality, these captives were vindictively named in the newspaper with home addresses, places of employment, uh, and, and places of employment, excuse me. These real criminal exposures led to dismissal, family rejections, and necessitated fleeing to London's anonymity but I was compelled to read each one in private shame. Standing next to Sister Susan, Sister Susan in Winter's warm kitchen, I read as the blood rushed to my face. Why you read, Trevor? Must be the oven I like, fleeing from the room in shame. The queer articles only came out on Fridays. One Wednesday, back in the kitchen again, I fearlessly opened the paper. I'd been tricked. A profile on a local homo stared back at me, just one paragraph and a black and white silhouette. Shocked, I slammed it shut and up to the bathroom ascended. On the toilet seat, breathless, a bit shamed and a bit excited, I read on. A local boy claimed, my age. Was he the one I passed every day as he crossed the, the busy dual carriageway while I passengered my way to the welding job? He had smiled a thank you once and I pictured us growing old together. Mentally pasting his face over the anonymous profile, I slowly closed the paper. I cut out this article and tucked it under my pillow to accompany my lonely nights. Then in a letter to the writer, I bravely wrote, I am also a homosexual. <laughs> am I really writing this? Can you help me, please? 
Please stop at the next mailbox. I asked my boss driving home through Berkhamsted. I need to pay a bill. I lied again. Standing on the cold pavement in front of the gaping mouth of Her Majesty's cherry red cast iron post box, I hesitated. Then I let it go. Out of reach to the bottom it fell. Clash, bang, wallop. Now, I think anyway, the whole town, even the ghosts that roamed its castle ruins, they all knew my secret. Her current majesty would not be amused to learn that her mailbox was being used to transport such immoral exposures. <coughs> Breathing shallow, anxious pops of hot air into early evening frost, I stumbled giddily back into the idling car. What are you up to, Trevor? The co-worker, the engineer who built meticulous model trains asked. Nothing, I lied, blushing. Then my letter appeared in print. <laughs> but, I, but I really couldn't tell anyone about my first piece of writing to be published. And I was not ashamed. I was really proud, really proud. A friend of mine has been living with cancer. Now I'm afraid that she may be dying. Twenty years ago, everyone I knew had a fatal disease or a friend who did. Then it was AIDS, impelling us into the streets, into jail, and into print. Now it's AIDS, cancer, and everything else that people well into the second half of their lives can't accept. Former caregivers are learning to receive. Jean was in her young 20s, already a leader in the new lesbian feminism, and half of the most adorable, butch, look-alike couple I ever did see. Two short, compact women, each with a shock of jet black David Bowie cut hair, impenetrable sunglasses, and miles of swagger. I was 18, bidding farewell to the fountain of yippee, not hippie, curls that erupted halfway down my back with my first dyke haircut, copied from those two. Thanks to people like them, when I went looking for the dykes, I knew where to find them. <laughs> there was a community center. There were dances and marches and touch football on Venice Beach, a sport at which I sat and was still welcome to play. <laughs> Jean was gay before she was a lesbian, before she was queer, when queer was something we were called by enemies. She pulled a homophile woman's society, which actually met in an unmarked basement, into the world of dyke activism, was the Latina lesbian columnist for the alternative newspaper of its day, created magazines and conferences and helped to lead every coalition around every electoral issue ever. A wide shot of her life gives us big history. Lesbian feminism, gay pride. In close-up, she is lovey to the wife whom she married decades ago in robes and garlands before family and at least a hundred friends. And again, quietly, when our marriages won, the legal recognition that her work had helped to bring. She's been my editor, my writing buddy who fills the margins of first and second and sixth drafts with apt, crisp comments. She once gave me money disguised as a loan, adjusted my scarf with surprising gentleness on a winter's night before I left her house. Queer pride is a composite creature a protean being whose DNA is written in books and movies and slogans bellowed into the night, whose muscles are big marches and legislative lobby days and mass arrests, whose sparkling synapses are private acts of friendship and loyalty and love. It was the Sahara on the mall. Sheets reflected their patchwork pictures upwards to the fall blue sky. Survivors walk between the histories of so many. They walked, paused, walked, ran, paused, then cried, and sat down to look across the Sahara and observe the colors of war. United Flight 182 was full. Why? School's in session, 
Tourists no longer crammed to see to the airport to see what was to be seen. Nobody should have been traveling, but they are. They are everywhere. Educated, slim, hair combed back, briefcase in hand, slacks, not jeans. They would stand in the aisle of, of United Airlines Flight 182 and talk about everything they didn't want to know. The flight was smooth. They drank cocktails that shivered from the vibrations of skimming over Kansas. They are here. They are everywhere. United Airlines Flight 182 is sold out. They looked odd. No torn t-shirts, not novels on trays, bonfires of the vanities, something by someone named Michael Nava, John Resher. No camp, no exposed midriffs, some smiles, no laughter. The magic carpet floated its sad genies to, to the ground. The John Retchy novel was bookmarked for a future reading. They are everywhere. The somber smiles, they have arrived. The chilling fall breezes are warmed by the Sahara that has taken over the mall. Standing on the precipice of a memorial to tragedy, the, pathway, the pathways lie flat in frozen undulation. Thousands of sheets, thousands of names, millions of memories, millions of stories, millions and millions and millions. The bartender, the dog walker, the politician, the librarian, I knew none, I knew all. They are everywhere. A simple story and a furious agony. They are everywhere. Then the sheets rose up and joined their corners and in a moment of angelic poetry began to dance around those who have not joined them yet but would never be the same. Louder and louder and louder. We are everywhere. We are everywhere. We are everywhere. We are everywhere. I know that I was a lesbian, a big old bull dagger long ago. When I was 13, attracted to both boys and girls, my favorite cousin, Helen, so sweet, so masculine, a big old dyke, would come to visit my mama, her auntie, and she brought along her best friend, Vani, who was just as butch, and I would get inexplicably excited. Each time I saw her, she brought Lil, high yellow, as feminine as an old tramp could be, slutty, and her daughter, always also high yellow, who giggled incessantly, high-pitched and annoying, and who clung to her mommy as though they were conjoined twins. I knew I was a lesbian even then. Days turned into years as I got crush after crush on one strong-willed woman after another, Hannah, Phyllis, Cecile, one after another, even as I cast doubt at myself, to myself, about myself, until finally I turned to face myself and accept myself and embrace myself as two strong-willed women helped me open my arms to myself, to the world, as I went place to place, group to group, coming out over and over and over, breast cancer support group. Is your husband supportive? I don't have a husband. I have a wife. Oh, and when one strong-willed woman had enough, she feigned psychosis, not a stretch, indignantly <laughs> tossed her dreaded locks and stalked away, having slapped her own ass as if to say, kiss my ass, motherfucker, and so that I was free again. And again, attracted to both boys and girls, all baked with steel colored hair. And I had proclaimed my big old dykedom dike so often, so loudly, that I could only whisper, I'm bisexual. So ashamed, so afraid, I do not like this. Does it matter? Do I need to rebrand myself? A new label? I have rationalized my whole life so often, so well. Do I really have to come out again? It's been 53 years. Whatever happened to free? Mm. When the alarm went off, I knew it was going to be a scorcher, just the way I like it, hot, balmy, and sweaty. And today is going to be a full circle kind of day. In 1971, I played the flute in piccolo with the Los Angeles Police Department Junior Marching Band. 
Because we won so many state and national awards with trophies festooned on our mantle, we were invited to perform at L.A. Shrine Auditorium and Houston's Astrodome, to name a few. With my regulation spats, wool trousers, crisp cotton shirt, ascot scarf, and jaunty beret, I marched in oodles of parades, replete with competitive precision and well-rehearsed marching band tunes. Now it's 1999. I would be marching in my first New York City Gay Pride Parade. I love a parade. What queer doesn't? I am a go-go boy in a group called Nan and Her Boys. We perform in nightclubs throughout Manhattan and at private parties. And because of our word-of-mouth popularity, we have been invited to participate in this year's celebration. How liberating. 28 years later, I am happily, scantily clad, red sequin hot pants with regulation black combat boots, and a baton. Life is good. <laughs> we have choreographed a fabulous routine to Bob Estes' arrangement of Yankee Doodle Dandy, and we perform with gusto along Fifth Avenue and then down Christopher Street with wild abandon where usually the asphalt streets cater to the maddening metropolis traffic, today they have been transformed into our own Broadway stage. We own it. I revel at the fact that I am comfortable to ogle and taunt the butch police parade chaperones with no negative repercussions. With my megaphone voice, I am able to shout to the rooftops loudly and proudly, I am queer, and I love it. <laughs> Gay Pride, New York City. Hordes of us lining the streets, vibrating music and gleeful smiles, one notch down, as if monitored by a smile meter, for this was a serious year, honoring those that passed, AIDS virus virulent, blowing in the wind like pollen puffs. This was the year we were not permitted to enter Central Park as our final destination, to rest, rehydrate, and party. The public park was off limits to us, a plagued people. This was the year we were rerouted, walking miles in circles, chanting under scorching sky. Chanting, chanting under scorching sky. The Flatiron Building remains vivid at that precise moment, synchronized as if the hordes of us, a choreographed dance troupe. We laid our bodies down, avenues of Manhattan ignoring hot asphalt and grime. We laid our bodies down. Lay our bodies down. Absolute and total silence. Thousands of us gravely muting this major metropolis, reverent. We honored all those who suffered and died, prayed for cures, prayed for less pain and less stigma, gave thanks for joys of diversity for us. For, for us. And when we stood back up, cloaked in unified dignity, a groundswell of pride on our sleeves pushed past the goosebumps.
west side between Santa Monica and Mel Melrose. Um, and yeah, I can't remember that's the name of it. And come to that. And if you are yeah. interested in being in the group, talk to me because you're always looking for new members. And um, I'm so proud of you. Thank you.